Hello, good morning. My name is Nathaniel Osgood from the Computational Epidemiology and Public Health Informatics Lab. And it's my great privilege, pleasure, and honor to be with you to share with you some of our work that is combining uh, artificial intelligence in the form of machine learning and data science on the one hand with population health uh, healthcare uh, issues on the other. Now, within the context of, of this very brief talk, um, which requires me to stay at a very high level for, um, for all components of it, I'm going to be focusing on, on two vignettes um, uh, that um, are important uh, for a couple of reasons. One thing is most work in, in seeking to combine machine learning and, and data science for health has gone on at the uh, clinical and particularly with respect to biomedical related factors um, uh, related to patient outcomes often consisting of, of, of uh, patient testing, um, um, genetic level information, uh, information from uh, electronic health records. Um, but comparatively little uh, effort has been expended in other areas. And uh, in the first vignette, I'm going to be talking about um, a more public health level uh, applications of um, machine learning methods um, and going to be focusing on how they can be combined with, with cognate uh, methods, uh, particularly from dynamic modeling that are theory based. Um, Vignette two, I'm going to be uh, also uh, turning to eliminate uh, possible applications of these methods to an area that I believe has been uh, previously quite underserved um, in terms of machine learning and data science, which is uh, has to do with mental health uh, issues and particularly um, the impact of, of service dogs and opioid dependent veterans with, with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, each of these vignettes will further um, uh, illuminate uh, different ways in which um, uh, data science and artificial intelligence, on the one hand, can um, uh, relate to uh, theory, to causal theories um, uh, that, uh, that may pre-exist um, uh, or may be being formulated within a, in a given area. So in vignette one, I'm going to be um, uh, we're going to be turning our attention to uh, the issues of communicable disease control. This is work that um, we've undertaken with cooperation from Alex Doroshenko at University of Alberta and Alberta Health Services, um, but also with uh, Dr. Jushin Liu, who served as a, a, a leading um, and guiding um, influence with respect to uh, some of the computational statistics uh, uh, techniques used here and, and elsewhere within our work. Work has also involved uh, you know, Dr. Cheryl Waldner of, of um, Western College of Veterinary Medicine. Now, um, methods within um, uh, artificial intelligence um, and machine learning are, are by many commentators contraposed um, uh, with uh, theory-based methods. Um, sometimes the uh, claim you'll hear advanced is that um, this new generation of, of uh, machine learning methods um, allows us to consider um, an exciting future world of, of move where we move beyond theory. Um, and uh, it is true that there are some elements of, of um, data science and machine learning, artificial intelligence, that focus on um, uh, recognizing, identifying, and exploiting uh, empirical regularities uh, within data, um, regularities that allow us to with very high confidence um, uh, predict certain outcomes um, with high fidelity to uh, what's, uh, what's actually uh, indicated in the underlying data without uh, support of, of underlying theory. Um, uh, so uh, often these methods are applied uh, before theory exists or when theory um, um, is very, very um, complex uh, uh, to formulate and, and uh, very speculative. But there's other ways in which artificial intelligence, machine learning, on the one hand, can can have a relationship with theory. And within this vignette, I can be talking about the ways in which such techniques be used to explicate um, uh, existing theory that that pre-exists uh, to better shed light on um, why um, and on the implications of incoming data um, for a future evolution of of an outbreak. Um, 
the focus here is on outbreak response. Um, this is a uh, problem that's been brought to us, uh, discussed with us by a variety of partners. Um, uh, here, we um, were seeking uh, to address um, the very real need to plan effectively for mobilization of health resources, uh, for example, to plan surge capacity in the context of outbreaks, particularly outbreaks associated with uh, uh, new and emerging uh, infectious diseases, think things like, like uh, SARS or, or MERS, um, um, but also uh, new strains of, of existing pathogens, uh, think H1N1 influenza, for example. Now, within these contexts, um, uh, there's a, a, a element of uh, infectious disease uh, pathology, but there's also concerns involving behavioral response that can lead to uh, unexpected surges in, in presentations, for example. Now, uh, within the, the context of, of outbreaks, traditionally we have um, uh, at, our, at our recourse um, uh, epidemiological curves uh, that, that specify, for example, incidence, case counts, perhaps on a daily or weekly basis over time. Um, but while those give us some sense of where we're at and might allow sort of crude statistical uh, extrapolation, often they give little clarity on what lies ahead. And even their depiction of the current situation is somewhat impoverished because while we may have a set of incident case counts, we're not sure what's driving the rise. Is it a rise in concern on the part of individuals that's driving increased uh, presentation? rather than a rise in underlying incidents, or is it indeed a, a rise in underlying incidents? Um, to what degree do we have a sizable pool of already recovered individuals from, say, earlier outbreaks who are going to blunt continued rise of the infection? In short, um, while uh, we may get some indication of, of behavior to the past and present, um, we often have an impoverished enough understanding of the current situation to give little clarity on what lies ahead. And often we're very poor at extrapolating um, what lies ahead just on the basis of, of that data. Our focus here lies in anticipating a trajectory of incident cases and an emerging outbreak, um, leveraging, um, uh, leveraging data, but also uh, leveraging uh, models. Um, Many uh, within the community of, of epidemiology have turned for the, to the use of uh, mathematical uh, models, which go by uh, many names and many sub-varieties, system dynamics models, compartmental models, um, uh, ordinary differential equation transmission models, uh, uh, models based on, on agent-based modeling or individual-based modeling. Um, to characterize the spread of epidemics. But in, in the context of, of understanding um, outbreak response, um, such models are encumbered by a variety of challenges. One of them is that they often um, quickly become outdated from the situation to which they are calibrated. Um, our understanding of the pathogen and people's response to it uh, grows over time in a way that might that is typically not going to be captured and certainly not automatically within the underlying model. Um, as the data emerges, we have a better and better sense of, of um, uh, characteristics of the underlying pathology. And again, without a lot of work in terms of calibration, it's not going to be captured within our, our model on an ongoing basis. Uh, moreover, our situation changes. Um, stochastics play out in unexpected ways. Um, uh, and we have uh, an updated understanding of, of the current situation, certainly, as time goes on, and the model is growing increasingly outdated with reference to it. So our goal here lies in creating an, an automatically updated system for theory-based model prediction um, uh, using uh, diverse sets of empirical data, not just one set, but a diverse set, um, in a way that will keep the model always current always current with the latest evidence, uh, always current with the, with the current situation as best understood, so that we can look forward um, with greater confidence in a way that, and we want to do this in a way that accounts for the fact that the data that we're receiving is not from heaven. It's, it's got big um, uncertainties associated with it. 
And the model that we're dealing with also has large uncertainties. We need to balance that and under, our understanding of what the current situation is in terms of, of, of looking forward as well. There's a second component of this that, that's going to feature very prominently um, in coming minutes, which is a question, look, um, uh, we have uh, to our recourse data often on, on lab conformed court cases or clinically confirmed cases of infection. Um, if we were to supplement that by, by data sets that from the traditional hierarchy of evidence perspective would be considered lower, lower quality. For example, data from social media chatter or from search volumes, um, uh, daily search counts on, on a service like Twitter, um, how will that affect the accuracy of our estimate? Will it contaminate our estimate to make it lower quality? Um, or by bringing a different type of information to the table, could it um, improve it? So we're going to be looking at that. Some of our other lines of work have, have uh, focused on um, how does the frequency of data collection uh, affect the accuracy? How far ahead can we look with confidence um, for a variety of, of different conditions? So the model we're going to be operating on is a is a previously published model from Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, contributed by Josh Epstein at Hopkins and, and Ross Hammond at Brookings, um, which depicts the, the co-occurrence of, of two contagions. Um, these are competing contagions associated with pathogen on the one hand, whereby people get infected, and, and a contagion associated with anxiety or concern um, or fear, um, whereby people um, can get uh, concerned uh, either from encountering other cases of, of, of infection or, or, or encountering other people who are infected with, with fear. Um, in a way to alter their behavior. Now, this is a compartmental model. So at any given time, people are divided up um, into a set of compartments. And over time, um, uh, people will shift between compartments. For example, as someone gets infected, they'll go from the susceptible to the effective state. Or as they grow afraid, they'll, grow, um, they'll go from susceptible to afraid. And there's different combinations captured. Um, the authors of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences paper um, uh, specifically adapted that model uh, to address questions related to influenza, which is the context in which we'll be applying it. Now, underneath this model, um, as is typical for uh, system dynamics ordinary dif or um, compartmental models, there's a set of ordinary differential equations, of state equations, that characterize model evolution in a quantitative fashion in a way that's directly informed by, um, by theory that's been built up since the work of Ross in, in 1916 and malaria and uh, Kermick and McKendrick in the late 1920s um, uh, for person-to-person um, -person communicable disease. Now, within this work, we're going to draw on um, sets of data that have been uh, historically contributed and relied upon very heavily for planning. And this includes uh, reported cases, um, uh, confirmed reported cases uh, from two jurisdictions. One is from Manitoba, where we see the two waves in 2009 and 2010. Um, uh, but we're also going to be looking at data from uh, Quebec. Um, where there's a, a premier vague and a, a deuxième vague um, uh, with roughly the same timings um, uh, as, as in Manitoba. So both of these in um, uh, major Canadian cities, um, cities with population of over, over a million. Now, our primary goal here um, was in leveraging techniques that we know from past contributions, several of which are are published, um, uh, we know can help us reliably create an automatically updated system. Um, but here we are interested in, in drawing in additional sorts of data. And the data that um, we're going to be drawing on here is on the coarser side of, of, of big data and health. It's, it's, it's search data. Um, uh, it's data that's in the public domain and shared by, uh, for example, Google Trends. Um, and uh, it can provide some indication of, of dynamics of interest uh, within a region. Um, for example, can clue us in to, um, uh, to emerging trends. This uh, Canadian searches from naloxone um, 
a key um, uh, inter, uh, inter, a key pharmaceutical to to uh, intervene in in the course of um, of a uh, of an overdose from opioids, and you can see the rapid rise in it um, within the last uh, few years preceding to this talk, um, uh, as concerns about opioid overdoses um, grew in Canada, uh, particularly in the British Columbia and and in east, eastern seaboard of Canada. Um, we're depicting here aggregate counts. We get a count on a per day basis. We're not we're not making use of individual behavior um, data. We're not capturing longitudinally um, the searching behavior of a person. We're not even capturing whether it's the same person tweeting many times or or um, many people tweeting tweeting once um, or searching once. Uh, I'm going to be confining my attention here. To, um, as it turns out, to search data, we, we have combined this later. Uh, we have done work and we're in the process of combining it with, uh, with Twitter-related data. Uh, this data is of, of moderate and temporal and geographic resolution. Basically, we can get daily regional counts. Nonetheless, it can tell us some interesting things. And one important thing it can tell us, uh, germane to the work at hand, is it can point to us, out to us the occurrence of shifted perceptions. Um, this data from uh, searches related to uh, pertussis, to whooping cough, within the Australian context, um, and showing a marked uh, regime shift um, uh, in uh, March of 2015. Um, now, uh, if one looks back um, into the Australian context at that time, particularly related to pertussis, you'll find that there's, uh, there was the highly publicized case of baby Riley, um, uh, a, 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 ch a child uh, within the first year of life that tragically died uh, unprotected by um, pertussis vaccine um, from complications of pertussis. And that led to a uh, pronounced shift in the degrees of interest related to pertussis um, that persisted for a matter of, of years, um, uh, indicating uh, uh, the importance that um, some of the communicational environment can have on on perceptions and indicating some of the value that that these sorts of, of searches can offer for understanding um, concern, anxiety, interest on the parts of individuals. Now, if we look at influenza um, within the Canadian context, which is the, the focus of our work here, we're going to be particularly looking at this period um, um, associated with the, the flu pandemic in 2009-2010. Now, um, a task before us um, uh, is to combine together uh, this, this model, uh, on the one hand, with, with this data, and, and to do so in a way that supports ongoing incorporation of data as it emerges, um, and incorporating it into our, our, our understanding of the situation, our ability to anticipate what's, what's coming, our ability to assess interventions and to predict occurrences of outbreaks. Um, now there's a set of different techniques that can be very useful when interfacing dynamic models on the one hand in a empirical data on the other, and I've listed them here. Um, we're gonna be focusing today on, on particle filtering technique and in this very, very simple case, we've applied it with much richer stratified models, also with agent-based models. Um, and um, some publications underway will, uh, will alert some of the viewers um, to models of that sort. Um, we've, we're also increasingly applying particle MCMC, which is a more powerful method uh, yet, which uses particle filtering, but with an extra layer to, to estimate uh, parameters. So given that this is going to be a central feature of, of this work, how does this particle filtering operate? Well, um, a few key facts. Basically, particle filtering with a model such as the one we're using is going to work um, at a crude level um, by allowing that model to be corrected with incoming data on an ongoing basis. Um, uh, it's going to um, allow us to sharpen our understanding of parameter values, and there are several parameters that we're allowing to uh, whose estimates were allowed to be um, improved here by allowing them to vary according to random walks and be corrected. 
Um, but it's also going to allow us to, to update our understanding of um, the values of the state variables. But it's not going to commit to privileging one estimate. If you run a model like this in a traditional system dynamics uh, simulation system or ordinary differential equation system simulation um, system, you'll find at any one time there's a certain number in, in, in each, um, each of these uh, stocks. So there's a certain number of people at a given time. At a given time, there's a certain number of people, for example, who are infective or, or susceptible or who are afraid or both afraid and infective. In our context, at, at a conceptual level, we're going to be running this model over a distribution of hypotheses, a distribution of different under possibilities for the underlying state of the system. Some of those hypotheses may, for example, posit many, many susceptibles, but no infectives and no recoveds, uh, a few afraid infectives, etc. Others may posit a great number of infectives, but very few susceptibles and comparatively large number of recoveds. Yet another hypothesis may posit quite a few uh, susceptibles and infectives, um, but not many downstream of that. In short, we're going to be running this model over a wide variety of simultaneous hypotheses, and there's going to be a and each of those hypotheses will be represented by a, a particle, uh, what's called a particle. So um, each particle represents a distinct hypothesis. And there's going to be a survival of the fittest of particles, whereby the particles that are most consistent with the data will be multiplied to, 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 to um, predominate. And those that are not very consistent with the data will tend to die out in very much a sort of genetic uh, analogy here. Um, uh, the, the, the fittest ones are those that best match the data. Now, how is that accomplished? Well, um, uh, essentially what's going to be going on is that each of the hypotheses we're going to attach a weight to. This is drawing on the theory of important sampling, where if we don't want to uh, draw a sample from a distribution, we can do so in two phases. Um, we can draw it from a rough distribution um, and attach, attach it with a weight that gives it its relative likelihood of occurring in the final distribution. And so it is here. Our particles can be associated with a weight that's going to indicate its roughly its probability of applying, um, uh, or probably density of applying. And uh, over time, as new data comes in, that weight will be updated. Um, uh, particles that are more consistent with the data, according to new empirical data, uh, will be uh, played up in terms of our emphasis on them. Um, we'll give them more credibility and their weight will be increased. By contrast, um, particles that uh, are not very consistent with the data will be played down in terms of their credibility um, and will, be, uh, will receive lower weights. Um, and uh, between observation points, we'll just run the model with the various hypotheses, but at observation points, there's this key component. And that key component is mediated, and I don't have time to go into this now, but have other treatments that go into it in more detail, by a likelihood function. So we have to specify as a key component in model formulation, a likelihood function. This is a, uh, in this case, it's in a Bayesian context, we'll have a prior, and we'll have a likelihood function as multiplication is a, gives a posterior, and the likelihood function will tell us, okay, for a given hypothesis that specifies, that posits a certain number of people susceptible, a certain number of people recovered, a certain number of people infective, et cetera, that is a full depiction of, of model state that it posits, what's the probability, given that hypothesis, that we observe the empirical data we do at a given point? Um, and uh, in this case, uh, as in several of our other past contributions, applying these methods, we're making use of a negative binomial distribution. Uh, this is work that harks back to work of Dori Gatti et al. Um, um, in, in also in the literature on MCMC for, for models. Um, and there's technical reasons having to do with robustness uh, associated with this. But essentially, we're going to use this likelihood to update the weight. We're going to multiply the current weight of a particle, when a new datum comes in, we'll assess the likelihood of that function given for a given particle, which depicts a hypothesis. We'll assess for that hypothesis what's the 
what's the uh, likelihood of observing this, this new uh, empirical observation? And we will um, multiply the weight of that particle by that. So if, if it's very likely that we'll observe this um, empirical datum, the weight will grow. If it's uh, at a relative level, it will it'll be larger. Um, if it's less likely, it will be smaller. And we perform a resampling step periodically, which will weed out low, low probability particles and emphasize high probability ones, um, high, highly weighted ones. So we're going to use this method to, to combine here, not just uh, the model with the, with the clinical empirical data, but with data drawn from search volumes here. So we're particularly looking at search volumes conducted in each of the jurisdictions, in Manitoba on the one hand and Quebec on the other, um, related to H1M1 flu. Um, and uh, the idea here is that, um, uh, that searching um, may indicate, uh, in, it certainly indicates interest in the part of individual in a topic, um, and it often will, will be associated with, with concern or, or, or fear. And we're not assuming all cases of it are, are necessarily fear related, but um, uh, that a certain fraction of people who are afraid, for example, will, um, will engage in, in tweeting. And we use Google Correlate to identify different uh, search terms that are highly related um, to allow us to, uh, uh, to project, um, project forward with, uh, or to, to, to um, uh, get a more robust sense of searching behavior. And, and, and for the case of Quebec, these are bilingual terms, uh, French and English. For the case of Manitoba, um, we, we concentrated predominantly on, on the um, English terms. So, so here we have a model which captures sort of underlying theory, underlying logic uh, about, the, about the system. Um, uh, logic has captured in those uh, differential equations that we saw earlier. Um, we specify sort of the, the underlying logic or mechanisms out there in the world that are posited to underlie the empirical regularities. And we want, want to bring it together with data like this in the clinical data. And we sought to investigate here, if we do the particle filtering just with respect to the clinical data on the one hand, or we conduct it with respect to the clinical data and the search data, how much of a difference does it, does it make to include the search data? And, and is that different? Does it get better or get, get worse? So here we're first going to look at the implications of of um, uh, performing particle filtering with model with respect to, to uh, the clinical data. Um, now these results are very much from a work in progress. They're being updated. So these probably are not going to be our final results, but I'll show you what the preliminary results show here. So with one likelihood based on clinical data, uh, here we see uh, to the current point, um, we're, we're imagining we're at, at time 40, day 40, and we've incorporated all the data to the current points to, to inform the model, to inform these parameter estimates that are varying, to inform our understanding of where we're currently at, um, correcting the model's understanding of where we're going to go next with, with each empirical data point shown in red. And now at time 40, we're imagining we're day 40 and we're going to look forward. And the question is, how well can we look forward? using just having the model just informed by clinical data, how far can we look forward in terms of clinical cases? And the answer here is for Quebec, we do very poorly looking forward. The model is only a very diffuse set, which within, within a matter of days, we have a very diffuse set of, of possibilities here. We're not at all sure in a broad range how many clinical cases we'll, they'll have, they'll be. Um, uh, projecting this this model for there's just not enough information in that original time series to allow us to to really project forward given given that model and for the search volumes as well if we're anticipating how many searches there'll be based on people being in states of of concern we also do very poorly we have some some sense of what might be coming up but it's very broad and it it's not a terribly good match um, after time 40 for the empirical data points. 
Okay, so this is using clinical data to inform the, the model alone. Um, uh, grounding the model with their, in its likelihood function um, only with respect to clinical data. Now suppose that we were to bring in search data. How would that change things? And um, short answer is it makes a, a world of difference. It's, it's like night and day. Um, in this context, we can project forward with much, much greater confidence. Uh, we can anticipate what's coming, uh, not with perfection by any means, but uh, much more tightly. Um, we have a high probability density interval that uh, if, if we're fairly generous with it, overlaps these data points for clinical cases and for search volume as well. Now, could this be a, a fluke associated with Quebec? Um, if we look at the Manitoba data, we'll see, um, see what that shows us. Well, here again, if we uh, simulate from up to time 35, here we can do somewhat better in projecting forward. The model is, is more confident and, and more on the money for about a week or so. Um, but then it kind of runs out of steam and quickly becomes very, very uncertain as to how many cases uh, they'll be looking forward from that. Can look forward about a week here um, using this model, using just the clinical data to this point. Um, and we also tend not to do so well from time 35 in anticipating how many searches there'll be. But if we bring in data from, from this sort of search volumes, we'll find we could look much further forward. Um, we can uh, anticipate, okay, okay, the outbreak is likely to start dying down after time 35. And the same thing here with, uh, with search volumes. We can look a couple weeks forward here before it gets too diverse, too, too, too diffuse, excuse me. Um, so in short, ladies and gentlemen, um, by bringing together uh, data from a lower quality data source, um, this, this online searches together and mix and, and and using it jointly with data from a higher quality data source, clinically or lab confirmed cases, we actually get much better results than if we purely learn, learn on the basis of the, the, the clinically confirmed cases. I'm much more confident about what's coming up. And, and in terms of the quantitative outcomes, it's like night and day. Um, if we depend only on clinical likelihood, the results are far, far more exhibit far, far more discrepancy from the actual data than if we use two likelihood functions. This is based on a, a discrepancy metric, which reflects the diverse uh, weighted hypotheses within the, the, um, the particle filtered model. Um, but, but basically it captures the, the broad discrepancy of, of model results um, with uh, the empirical data. And we see it's like night and day, bringing in uh, both sets of data Google and clinical likelihood gives far and away better results than either in isolation. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Now, that's one use of these techniques to automatically keep a model updated. And what we see here is a provocative thing. It's by drawing on lower quality data sources, we can sometimes do much, much better than we can if we only rely on high quality data sources. Perhaps counterintuitive, but it makes sense if one reflects on the fact that they capture different information. But there's more to the, to the picture than this. Um, in addition to projecting forward, this procedure gives us what I'll um, call, for lack of a better term, sort of a, a tomographic view of, of, of the health of the population. Um, many of the, the viewers here will, will um, likely be familiar with uh, the fact that Modern MRI, modern imaging um, uh, modalities such as MRI on the one hand or, or CT scan on the other, work not by by getting one purely one really good image and and basic basing a radiologist's judgment off of that, but rather they give up an amazingly detailed three dimensional view of of the state of the internals of a patient, not from one image, from a, a whole collection of images. Um, in fact, the physical design of these machines suggests that. They take images from many different angles, and any one of those images is terribly fraught. It's, it has a very limited field of view. 
It, um, it has occlusions, so radiation propagating from, from that direction. Um, uh, may encounter, for example, bones or other structures that, that block its propagation. Each image is, is terribly limited and short. But you combine all those images together and, and you get a cohesive, coherent, unified picture of what's going on inside uh, the patient. And so it is with the sort of particle filtering. So it is when we take these different types of data sources, high quality, low quality, but with different sorts of information, and we combine them with the logic uh, of an underlying model, um, the fact that, that you know, there's certain stocks that are connected together. You can flow from one to the other, but you can't flow between uh, arbitrary stocks uh, here. You can't flow directly from a move due to fear and infection over here to afraid, for example. You can't go back from afraid infective to infective. There's a logic to this model. Its interconnections um, uh, mean that information observed in one part can tell us about what's going on and not just that one part, but in a couple of different areas. And once you start knitting that together, um, you could start to get a cohesive picture. For example, if, if we have a, a measurement here um, that's quite high for the number of people getting susceptible, or, or excuse me, getting infected, um, it, it's gonna tell us, well, look, there have to be at least some infectives and there have to be at least some susceptibles. And if there's a lot of people getting infected, there's probably a, at least a, a, a pretty large number of at least one of these, maybe on, on both of them. Um, and, uh, it can even start to tell you uh, eventually, over time, it can start to tell you about other stocks. For example, recovered here, um, over time, uh, it's going to be telling us something about what infective is over, over those, that same period of time or slightly earlier. Because uh, if recovered is going up very rapidly, it's probably an indication that there is quite a number of people infected in one stock or another. So at the least, it going up constrains our understanding about what the count is that must be in, in these different stocks. So this is what we get out of this population tomography. We get from many different data sets in the model logic, we can illuminate areas of the system that are not instrumented, where we don't have direct data because the model, the logic of the model is such that inevitably, given the structure of what data we do have, it inevitably points, there's gotta be, um, there's gotta be a certain number of people in this stock or this stock, um, in this area of the model at an earlier time. So we can get out a depiction of stocks where we don't have data directly. For example, the number of people exposed or the number of people who are recovered, the number of people susceptible. At a given time, as data is coming in, we get guided as to how many people there are likely to be in that stock. And then when we project forward in this time from about uh, time 240, we can see, okay, then we're increasingly uncertain about these other stocks as well. So in short, we get this sort of um, uh, picture from what data we do have in the logic of the model that can illuminate our understanding of, of latent areas in the model. Another use of, of these sort of techniques is to, to try to predict in the next month um, what's likely to happen. Now, as you might imagine, this hinges a lot in our understanding of this latent state. If we're really off about the current situation, if we're really off about how many, if we're very uncertain about how many susceptibles are, we're going to have a very hard time estimating, in, in some cases, how the likelihood of an outbreak in the next little bit. If we don't have some good sense as to how many infected people there are, it's going to be very hard as well. Um, conversely, if we know with great confidence there are a very large fraction of recovered people, it's 99% of the population, it, it will shape our understanding of the likelihood of an outbreak very significantly. So if we can estimate latent state, then we can do outbreak prediction quite well. And one way to do this is to ask, okay, is an outbreak likely to occur in the next little bit of time? For example, in the next month. This is a classification task. So if we're gonna ask about the accuracy of this, we can't just say, well, what is 
the accuracy. Um, it's going to vary depending on how, how our, our desired specificity um, are willing to tolerate, tolerate false positives. Um, we, um, we, we can specify a true positive rate. And what this is telling us is, even if we're willing to tolerate very few false positives, very few false alarms, cases of crying wolf, we could still get a pretty darn good true positive rate. And if we're willing to, to uh, to tolerate being, you know, having a, a false positive rate, a false alarm rate of say 20%, we can predict an outbreak in the next month with somewhere around 85% accuracy is what these very preliminary results are suggesting. And the overall area on the ROC curve that the, um, the receiver operating characteristic curve here is nearly 90%. Um, Another thing we could do, if we have an understanding of the latent state, is we can, we can anticipate what's likely going to occur in the next little bit of time. Um, uh, if we undertake an intervention, if we don't. To a certain degree, for the baseline, that was implied by this, right? We're, we're projecting forward and we're judging as a matter of predictive accuracy how accurate the model is. Here, if we undertake no changes, uh, no intervention, we see a certain anticipated course of, of affairs um, with an outbreak anticipated. But if we put it in, that implies a certain thing about the expectations in terms of latent state of the system. But if we put in place an intervention, say a 20% reduction in contract rate, uh, we can anticipate out what's likely to, to happen. Given our understanding of latent state where we're at, we could say, okay, what's likely to happen when we put this intervention in place? Very, very powerful. Um, now we've applied this technique to a wide variety of area of applications. We've got active work applying it to opioids. Um, we've also applied it to a wide variety of uh, infectious diseases, um, to a zoonosis and, and to um, uh, an issue in health services delivery. And important, we have applied it with uh, not just that very simple aggregate model like that depicted here, but highly stratified mo aggregate models and agent-based models as well. Um, very powerful method. I want to highlight in terms of, of theory here, the model here is capturing in an operational form theory about the underlying situation. We're not deducing this model from the data here. This is a model that that uh, was created based on an understanding um, as crafted through uh, uh, what's approaching now, uh, uh, actually a bit over a decade, uh, a century of, of uh, mathematical epidemiology, um, capturing based on natural history of infection, et cetera. Based on underlying theory, we built this model. We've, we've explicated its implications in terms of data that we do see, both higher reliability data and less uh, and, and more noisy data in terms of understanding what we expect going forward. This is one of the relations that machine learning can bring to the cable to help us leverage our existing theories. Um, it's a very powerful technique and it's one that can be used on an ongoing basis. Uh, the second vignette is going to be very different here, ladies and gentlemen. It's going to focus instead on, on um, uh, a, a very different area of application, but it shares with the past vignette a focus on illuminating areas of, of health um, and healthcare where, where these techniques have little been used. And particularly it focuses on, on service dogs um, for opioid dependent veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder. So here we have a dog uh, with a collar with a, um, um, a Bluetooth beacon, a device from the Internet of Things. And the veterans paired with the dogs um, uh, will be um, touting wearables. So they're going to have a Fitbit um, on the wrist here um, uh, and uh, carry smartphones as well. Uh, this is a smaller study. It's, it's nine and a half months uh, in duration. It's a modified case crossover trial. We do have six controls who have companion animals alone, although there's not as much data collection going on in them. And it leverages wearables, phone sensors, and Internet of Things devices. Now, the research questions we brought to the table here are somewhat different um, than in the last vignette. 
We're interested at an overall level in understanding the impact of highly trained service dogs on well-being of veterans uh, with PTSD and opioid use disorder. But we're, understanding, we're interested in understanding why we see those effects. Which are the primary generative pathways, to use the language of critical realism, by which these impacts are realized? And are there particular pathways whose differential effects can explain differences in, in outcomes among different participants? Now, in order to appreciate why we're interested in these pathways, it, it bears discussion um, the, the impact of introducing a service dog um, uh, for a veteran, and particularly a service dog that's, can, that's going to be uh, highly trained with respect to that veteran, um, in terms of thinking about how it impacts their sense of well-being. And perhaps the foremost thing I want to emphasize here is it's complex. It's not merely complicated. In a technical sense, it's complex. We have these set of entangled factors um, which yield a whole greater than the sum of the parts. Um, uh, they're tangled with each other. They're coupled. Um, and if we want to understand um, how to improve our interventions, we do well to, to understand which pathways are securing the greatest effects and which are, which are we successfully changing with a service dog and which are we not changing. To figure out why that's such a quandary, let's just enumerate a couple of ways in which um, uh, provision of service dogs to the veteran might offer benefit. Well, look, one way um, is uh, by engaging with a service dog, um, uh, the, um, the person is provided with some companionship for the dog. This uh, provides a sense of companionship that lessens their sense of alienation and um, it improves um, uh, their functioning in terms of sense of well-being, uh, lowers the risk of suicidal ideation, and lowers the risk of, of opioid use. But in addition to that, um, there's a variety of other factors. One is that, look, with, with the dog, there are certain needs for the dog that require the veteran to, to attend to them, and that can add structure to the veteran's life, which can enhance sense of well-being. Another factor here, though, is that um, the times engaging with the service dog um, uh, brings the veteran outside their home, and, and that leads to lower sedentary be behavior, um, which, which impacts their health and their sense of well-being, but also leads to potentially moderate uh, physical activity, um, potentially even, even vigorous physical activity. Think about jogging with a dog and... Um, and you know that that can enhance physical health and, and a sense of well-being from feeling well exercised. But beyond that, um, and so those are other pathways to affect perhaps moderate vis vigorous physical activity. Another one on, on sedentary behavior. But there's other effects too. Look, if we're drawing people outside their home, uh, they're coming in in contact with other people. Um, and one of the advantages I've been I've learned from from the uh, the trainers of these dogs is that with the dog a veteran can can choose how much distance they want from others within the communities. Do they want to draw um, uh, close to, to someone um, and talk more closely, or just keep a distance with the with the dog, um, engage only in a distant way? It allows the veteran to over time um, come to feel more comfortable with reaching out, but but keeping a certain uh, distance when they feel they need it. So it can allow them to sort of broker their and, and throttle their, their uh, contact with others so that's uh, comfortable. I'll give them a sense of, of companionship or lower sense of uh, alienation and, uh, and thereby impact uh, well-being and, and opioid use, et cetera. Beyond that, though, um, the service dog actually, by virtue of being in training, um, it, it actually brings them in contact with the service dog community. And uh, these are other veterans with service dogs, um, and that too can lower a sense of alienation. But finally, these are highly trained service dogs. These are dogs that are trained to intervene um, in detected uh, stresses on the part of, of um, their owners, according to particular patterns of stress. Um, and, uh, and they can interrupt flashbacks and, and particularly interrupt them before the flashbacks uh, really get started. And this can, uh, this can enhance a sense of well-being. Um, 
Uh, it can lead to uh, avoiding the overwhelming physical sensations that otherwise accompany a, a flashback. My colleague, uh, Colleen Dell, who's the co-lead on this work, um, uh, is a, a, a chair in, in mental health and addictions, who's helped me understand some of these factors. And I should have mentioned that Autumnus, um, the service dog trainer, um, engages in highly rigorous uh, training of service dogs to, to bring them up to this level of, of skill. So how is AI relating to theory in this case? Well, we're trying to inform theory and cross-check theory, challenge theory as, as captured within a diagram such as this. But we're also trying to capture the salient empirical regularities that, that link observables that where there's a lack of theory available. In order to do this, we're leveraging mobile data collection. And particularly our third generation platform, um, Ethica. Um, we started our work in 2009, 2010 in the uh, flu pandemic. This is our third generation platform. It, it is uh, uh, a spinoff company and, and uh, it's one doing well. Uh, somewhere between uh, 50 and 100 studies have been conducted with Ethica or its uh, predecessors in our lab. And it's used worldwide um, by uh, a vast number of, of, of different uh, studies. Um, it runs on uh, Android and, and iPhone smartphones, but also has a rich uh, web interface for defining uh, studies for monitoring continued involvement by participants performing both more routine and, and more custom analytics. And it's uh, uh, typically installed on our to participant uh, smartphones. Um, it allows us to collect diverse sensor modalities, as we'll see, including triggered questionnaires. Um, but uh, a key component of it is also the ability to, um, to customize uh, the study. So the idea here is, look, without programming being required, just by going to the website, by the dashboard, and setting up a study here, configuring it through a graphical user interface, you can set up specify what that user interface should include, what custom buttons it offers, for example, um, uh, what's in the background. You can specify which sensors are to uh, be sampled um, uh, by, by the particular study. Um, and uh, you can specify questionnaires. And these questionnaires are specified in a way similar to SurveyMonkey or, or uh, Google Forms, where you sort of drag and drop questions and this can include rich questions like audio and, and photo, uh, unit uh, questions where the participant can select units for weights and heights, um, uh, uh, visual analog scales, um, uh, traditional multiple answer or single answer uh, questions, um, et cetera. And all of this can evolve through a study. So, you, so if you fix a typo, you can push it out to participants, uh, et cetera. So in this case, um, we're relying on a combination of traditional methods with uh, classic survey instruments um, and interviews uh, on the one hand with a really rich smartphone environment. The smartphones here issue microsurveys, ecological momentary assessments that, um, that are going to assess a variety of factors I'll be talking about in a minute, and they have a set of sensors. We additionally have the Fitbit on the um, uh, on the uh, veteran, which measures heart rate and, and sleep. And on the dogs, there's the Bluetooth beacons mounted on the collars. Um, uh, we further have uh, prescribing history uh, captured during uh, the study um, from the veterans. So in terms of sensors, we're making use of a wide variety of sensor types, um, you know, gyroscope, uh, accelerometer, GPS, et cetera. But the basic deal here uh, from a functional level is that we can measure a bunch of things. Perhaps most importantly, um, through Bluetooth beacon signal strength, we can measure the distance between the smartphone and, and the dog. Um, and uh, this allows us to spend, uh, to quantify how much time the veteran is spending with the dog. Through GPS, we can, we can measure two things. We can get a sense of the geographic mobility and the, the entropy, or the predictability of that, of the toings and frummings um, of, of, uh, of the veteran. Um, but um, uh, we can, beyond that, uh, get a sense of how much time they're spending indoors and out or, or outdoors. Um, we can get a sense of how much they're mixing with other uh, veterans by looking at the contact with other veterans, dogs who are in the program. Um, and through accelerometry and heart rate, um, uh, both on the 
uh, the accelerometry of both the phone and the Fitbit and on the Fitbit itself, we can get an understanding of physical activity or sedentary behavior. Um, uh, we can further get a sense of, of sleep length and regularity from the Fitbit. And um, we're hoping, um, and we believe it's likely, we can get an understanding of flashback occurrence by a combination of heart rate, sleep, accelerometry, and time. Um, in addition to those, there's a variety of features tracked via self-report on the device. And these include aspects of PTSD symptoms, substance use, um, uh, emotional intelligence, human dog bond, but also triggered by the dog absence, um, a, a reason that they were separated from the dog, barriers to spending time with the dog, um, uh, be it uh, emotional or practical, logistic, um, um, issues of dog's health, etc. cetera. Um, and we do this by triggering a survey when uh, the dog has not been in their proximity for a, uh, a certain length of time. In other studies, one might trigger when one is close to a, to a beacon, for example, on Ethica. And with traditional interviewing and self-report, um, um, with more traditional measures, um, we can get an understanding of, of suicidal ideation and, and depression, PHQ-9, and physical health, et cetera. So what this gives us is, is a very detailed uh, view of, of um, the uh, progression of a given veteran. Um, we can have a sense of, over time, uh, how much time they're spending with the dog, uh, not, not shown here. Um, but we can have a sense of when their sleep was good, um, when they've encountered flashbacks, um, when they've engaged in moderate to vigorous physical activity, um, how much they've been outside, the degree of sedentary behavior, um, their encounters with social engagement or, or changes in substance use. We can get this longitudinal picture. Critically, and you'll recall, our interest in understanding multiple pathways to, to effect of introducing a service dog and a sense of well-being. Well, with traditional instruments, we can get some understanding of that. But using the data from the smartphones, we can get, and, and from the Fitbits and, and, and the Bluetooth beacon on the dog, we can get a much, much better sense along multiple pathways of what's going on. This information can't currently allow us to deduce necessarily causally which pathways are predominantly driving the situation. But what it can do is point out to us that cherished prejudices we may have about, you know, that, that the pathway is predominantly mediated by, um, uh, for example, the uh, changes in, in, in moderate to vigorous physical activity, uh, which should be read here, um, uh, it can challenge the belief that that's the primary pathway by showing there's almost no change um, at, at the, cross case, uh, the case crossover point between, you know, when the dog was, uh, the, the veteran had just gotten the dog was still untrained till, till later. There may be no significant change in, in physical activity, for example. Uh, ideally, we'd like to do it pre-dog. Um, uh, or it may tell you, you know, the amount of time that they spend with the service dog community is so low to, to realistically not be able to account for things. So in short, this isn't a magic bullet, being able to instrument all these, but it can challenge um, uh, misconceptions of what's going on along these different pathways. Tell us, for a given intervention, when have we changed a pathway significantly, when haven't? And it can allow us to look at different individuals who may have very different responses in terms of impact on their well-being, what are the salient differences among these different pathways that best explain why we see those differences? Um, so these, these pathways, understanding these pathways to affect these generative pathways is important for, for helping us understand which pathways are major drivers, um, uh, for understanding uh, primary research for lack of intervention success. So in this area, we make, uh, we're, we're planning uh, on a use of a wide variety of, of machine learning approaches. Um, this work is just recently underway, and we're going to be doing a lot of this work over the next year. Um, these include some basic uh, items, however, which we've been working on for years. For example, classifying reliably with, we use uh, hidden Markov modeling for most of our work, is the phone even being carried? Um, or how much time they're spending indoors or outdoors, something we've also looked at. Um, also spent a lot of time assessing um, reliable detection of, 
of whether two individuals or a person and their dog are, are, are close to each other and in the same space. But we need to evolve additional methods, for example, to, to recognize occurrences of flashback or time spent with other veterans. Beyond that, um, and, and we're hoping to use deep learning for a number of these too. Beyond that, we're hoping to use a similar set of, of, of methods, but also including graphical, Bayesian graphical models for high level, um, higher level classification. For example, can we determine without self-report um, and without relying on prescription history, would it be possible absent those to determine from sensor data alone, say how much time someone has spent sed sedentary, sudden changes associated with their socialization patterns or sedentary behavior or physical activity patterns, sudden changes associated with their mobility, whether someone's opioid use disorder is likely reemerged. If we can detect that through sensors alone, it might allow for formulation of early interventions, potentially heading off an overdose. Um, we might be able to also, um, we're hoping to create a, a classifier for early warning signs for a failure to thrive that might indicate need for, for further support for an individual or the level of follow-up required. How, how often do they need to see the dog trainer to, to, have, to really realize their full potential to get out of the program? Um, in terms of prediction, we'd like to be able to predict ahead of time, for example, coming recurrence of opioid disorder, if, if possible, or high risk of, of very short-term substance use, potentially in the future to, to intervene, um, to warrant a phone call or to, um, uh, to give them uh, helpful nudges uh, on the smartphone. We'd also like to be able to anticipate probability early on of successful bonding with a dog that might allow us to know if maybe this dog is not working for this, uh, for this veteran. And we're using, um, we're planning use of, of techniques we've used elsewhere, such as Bayesian graphical model and deep learning support factor machine um, in these areas as well. Uh, these are techniques uh, which we've applied in, in different uh, contexts, most of them um, in, in the context of, uh, or many of them in the context of, of smartphone-based analysis. So a couple key take-home messages here. Artificial intelligence and data science can offer ways to help, help keep causal models current, to help us infer the latent state and anticipate change. This is very important. Um, these sort of theory-based models um, can be key for, for building confidence on part of stakeholders that um, uh, what's going, um, that, that one has captured important features of the situation. They're key for learning over time, um, capturing our understanding and, and testing its consistency with empirical data. And uh, AI and data science offer key ways to keep these models current, to, to enhance their value by explicating the implications of theory in light of new data, keep the models current with, with current data and for the latent state of the system and anticipate coming change. Another key use of these models, and the reason that we need them to be causal is because we're interested in counterfactuals. We're interested in understanding how the system behavior will change when we undertake an intervention. And with causal and dynamic models, that's what we can do. And um, we can do that in a way that's further leveraged by AI and data science, such as when we estimated the latent state using AI and data science, um, and allowed us to project forward the impacts of interventions in a probabilistic way. So AI and data science, far from being just, you know, contraposed to, to theory-based models, far from trying to replace them, can, can also aid in theory building. And, and um, at the same time, they can capture patterns lacking current theoretical foundations. Deep learning, um, we use TensorFlow, for example, for that, can arrive at models that may be very good at prediction, given the current context. We don't know how well they'll be good at prediction if we, if we change features of those contexts, but they may capture these important patterns now, which we can, which can clue us into things that do require explanation with theory-based methods. AI and data science can inform decisions of, at all, all different levels of health and healthcare, but a key use of this data um, is, is to understand the effects of intervention. It's to understand why we see these effects, to go from beyond a situation where we know very little, or it's largely speculative when we just measure changes in the outcomes 
go beyond just having scattered scattered information on pieces of the system based on which is highly problematic due to recall bias and really give us a pulse on what's happening when we undertake an intervention. Give us a sense of what we have nudged and we haven't. And even if uh, an intervention is unsuccessful, if we've learned more effectively from it what worked and what didn't, we fail forward. It, it gives us a sense of, 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 of how to do much better next time, um, which is of key importance. Electronically captured data that we've been examining here is increasingly ubiquitous and offers a great deal of strength to AI approaches. Um, and uh, it raises a lot of opportunities for dynamic modeling and, and uh, for understanding health services outcomes. And finally, I'll, I'll just mention something which um, I, you know, I haven't emphasized early in the talk, but I think it's an important feature of, of why to apply these methods. Um, one of the key facts is um, we increasingly catch, and our population members um, largely uh, also cast shadows in the electronic realm that are very significant. Our knowledge, our attitudes, our beliefs, our behaviors are captured, whether it's in status updates on, on Facebook or tweets we send out reporting, you know, we're, we're down for a few days with, uh, with the flu, um, uh, whether it's aspects of our, our health behavior that we share with others on Endomondo or, or Fitbit Social. Um, uh, and whether it's information captured by our smartphones. Our health increasingly writes signatures uh, writ large in the, in the uh, electronic sphere. Um, and not only can we capture those signatures, capture these digital shadows of our health behaviors using these novel analysis methods, not only do we need novel analysis methods to, to understand um, that data effectively. But increasingly, ladies and gentlemen, those digital shadows, far from being simple shadows, they're influencing us. The behavior shared by others or endo Amondo may, may cause us to up our game on our morning run. Um, uh, what we see on others from Fitbit Social will give us ideas for our exercise regimen. Um, the tweets from others about concern about um, you know, an an uh, outbreak of, of a novel infection may raise our awareness and concerns about that. Um, uh, skepticism about that that um, uh, anti vaxxers share on on Twitter may affect um, a world of followers. And in order to understand those profound effects, which may grow to be just as profound as the effect of the built environment and the food environment in shaping. Um, human behavior as well as knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs in the health sphere. Um, in order to capture those effects, we need these new types of methods, whether it's dynamic modeling, dynamic modeling particularly combined with data science um, and, and rich forms of, of causal analysis like um, um, convergent cross mapping, um, uh, Perl's uh, uh, causal analysis, et cetera. We need these methods to make sense of, of this data because it's not merely a luxury. It's a necessity to understand profound effects shaping our society, but it's also a profound opportunity because it gives us these windows of insight into human health behavior um, that can make a profound difference. That's all I have time for today. Thank you very much for your patience and it's been an honor to have you join this talk. Thanks very much.